Good morning and um, welcome everyone on behalf of Andalusia Travel. Thank you so much for being here and taking part of the of this webinar, which will be focused on the opportunities for the agri-tech companies in the United Kingdom. My name is Maria Zumarraga. I am the coordinator of market development in the United Kingdom at Andalusia Travel, a company that belongs to the Andalusian government devoted to support the development and internationalization of Andalusian companies. In a few seconds, my colleague Felipe Martinez, director of Andalusia Travel's office in London, will give us some more details about the content and the uh, and the guests of the webinar. But before that, I would like to remember you that at the end of the session, you will be able to send your uh, your your comments and and your messages through the chat. So you are very welcome to participate and make the most of the webinar. And if you feel uh, it is easy for you, you can send your comments in Spanish and we will translate them into English. So I would also like to remember you that this webinar is being recorded and you will be uh, able to see the video in our website in Andalucía Trades uh, TV. So thank you so much and I hope you will enjoy the, the webinar. Felipe. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, I would also like to, to thank all the company's representatives and uh, other professionals who joined us this morning for this agri-tech webinar. The agri-tech sector is experiencing a rapid growth in recent times and is now becoming a very important industry within the UK economy. The UK agri-tech sector contributes to the UK agricultural sector worth more than £14 billion and is currently employing directly or indirectly more than 500,000 people. At Andalusia Trade, we are most keen on exploring potential ways of collaboration between British and Andalusian companies. Thus, we decided to hold this webinar specially dedicated to this particular industry. Next, I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Belinda Clark is the director of Agritech E, Europe's largest commercial membership network connecting farmers and growers with researchers, technologists, entrepreneurs and investors. The main aim is to bring together those who see innovation as a way to enhance the economic growth, agricultural productivity and environmental sustainability of the agri-food value chain. Belinda is also a trustee of the Royal Norfolk Agricultural Association and non-executive Director of Agrimetrics, one of the UK, UK's agri-tech centres. She has a first degree from the University of Cambridge in Natural <laughs> Sciences and a PhD in Plant and Biochemistry from the, from the John Innes Centre, University of East, of East Anglia. She is an Uffield Scholar and Associate of the Royal, the Royal Agricultural Councils and um, a fellow of the Royal Society of Biology, chartered bio biologist, and a qualified business coach. So it's now over to you, Belinda. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Philippe, and thank you, Maria, as well. And it's a very great pleasure to be here this morning. And we're very much looking forward to a strong and productive relationship with our friends in Andalusia, and we very much look forward to meeting you in person. Maria, may I have my slides up, please? Yes. So while that's happening, just as Philippe says, I run Agritech E. And if you take away one piece of information from what you're about to hear from my colleague Michael and myself, it is that you are guaranteed a very warm welcome in the UK from your business, your technology, your research. But you heard that there's 500,000 people uh, in this sector. Michael and I are just two of them. And there's a lot of other people that uh, we can both introduce you to, to help you accelerate your technology, your business. Uh, hopefully we'll find out in the chat what you're particularly interested in, but you are very welcome. So what I wanted to do is to just introduce uh, the, the ecosystem, as we call it, to give you a sense of what you can expect doing business in the fresh produce sector in the UK. So, Maria, if I could have my next slide, please. 
So I won't read all this information out to you. You can read it yourselves. But what I was trying to do with this slide is to give you an indication of the priority areas in fresh produce in the UK. So there is a big interest in sustainability. As you can see in the top bullets, over a third of consumers look for sustainable products. And the use of single use plastics is reducing. So our fruit and vegetables are being packaged differently to maybe five years ago. There is also a big emphasis on health. There is an increased uh, purchase of fresh fruit and vegetables. And so there is a general trend, particularly since the pandemic, for more fresh fruit and vegetables. And as you will see, a third of consumers are now eating more fruit and vegetables and also buying more locally produced goods. If I may have the next slide, please, Maria. So the next slide shows the size of the market. Uh, I've put some pictures of our most common fruit and vegetables, but we have a very diverse diet and taste in the UK, as I'll come on to. And you can see the numbers are very big. These are 2021 data, over 10 billion pounds spent on fruit, and it should be 15 billion spent on vegetables. Uh, because of our climate, we can't be self-sustained all year round in fresh produce. So we do import around £7.5 billion worth. And as you can see, we are across Europe uh, the third biggest. If I could have the next slide, please. What I wanted to do in this slide is to give you an indication of the kinds of drivers and trends. And I know I was in Spain in Valencia earlier this year that many of these drivers and trends are the same that you will be experiencing with growers in uh, in the Spanish market in Andalusia. Shortage of labour, the drive to net zero. The UK has a particular um, strength in what we call enabling regulation. And I will come on to this, that the regulatory environment for technology, for breeding is, is very supportive in the UK. Now, some of us still regret that the EU, the UK has departed from the EU, but what this has meant is an ability to have autonomy over some of our regulations. And one example of that is the Genetic Technologies Precision Breeding Bill Act, which now enables the use of gene edited material in the research community. I'll come on to the fact that we're seeing technology from other sectors coming in. It is no longer chemistry, machinery and breeding that is underpinning uh, technology. I'll, my next slide will show you some of the other technologies that are now coming into the sector. And we're seeing a market for, um, sorry, if you could go back. Um, thank you, that's perfect. A market for ethnic plant-based foods. Now, I won't read out all these technology opportunities. I'm sure people on the webinar are active in a lot of these technologies as well. But I wanted to give you some, some indication of the match between the drivers and trends and the technology solutions that are in development and indeed being used on farm by growers uh, to try and respond to these trends. So next slide, please, Maria. So the UK is a very innovative environment. It's a very good place to bring new technologies. We have a cohort of farmers who run very large fresh produce operations who are always very keen for new technologies. Now, how do you, what is the route to market to meet those people? Well, obviously I would say it's through my own organization, Agritech E, and through Michael's organization, which you'll hear about, but there are many trade associations and conferences. And here's just an example of some of them that you can attend uh, to really meet the growers and showcase technologies. I can have the next slide, please. This is just a very quick slide. I wanted to just indicate the scale and pace of acceleration of technology adoption. This uh, image we developed in 2017 as a very out there, very futuristic view of agriculture. And here in the UK, I think it will be very hard to find a farm which is not using uh, 
a large number of these kinds of technologies. So next slide, please, Maria. The, the message I want to leave you with is that this is a very vibrant pro-technology industry. And I won't read all of these different technologies out, but these are how different tech from other sectors are now landing and being used in the UK and indeed globally. And there are some that are particularly gaining traction. Obviously, I mentioned genetics, artificial intelligence, uh, the robots, everybody's very interested and keen in robots. So we're seeing all of these technologies coming together in agriculture alongside chemistry, machinery, and traditional breeding. Next slide, please. So moving to Agritech E, one of the things that we can do to help is to help you forge links and relationships, not just with growers, but also with other members of the ecosystem and policy makers. And um, I won't read all of these out, but the large picture at the bottom with the robot, this is the governor of Missouri. Uh, Missouri in the US is a state with big needs of agriculture and they came to meet us, came to, to Cambridge to discover what technologies our community had that could help with their agriculture. The, I will just mention the picture above that, the orange um, picture. You can just see our former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, that picture was taken in Downing Street. So you can get right to the heart of uh, legislation, of policy making, indeed lawmaking in the UK. Next slide, please. We also want to take our community to the growers. Uh, so I mentioned some of the shows. This is the Royal Norfolk show, the innovation hub that we run. Uh, the picture on the bottom left, I'm in the pink jacket and the gentleman in the green jacket next to me is our Minister for uh, Agriculture. And the picture to the right, the lady in the orange dress is uh, a former prime minister. So just to illustrate that there is a, an opportunity to really speak at a very high level to meet these uh, kind of influences. Next slide, please. The next slide just shows um, a, an example of one of these shows. I mentioned earlier that regenerative agriculture, the idea of uh, growing in a way that's more sustainable, that puts back value into the soil, is a real priority in the UK. And this is an example of one of those shows. It's now a very big show called Groundswell. And we gave our members uh, an opportunity to showcase their technology to the growers. And we ate a lot of ice cream, which I know is not as nice as Spanish ice cream, but um, that, was, uh, that was a good day out in the sun. Can I have the next slide, please? It's also very important, we think, that technology uh, developers and researchers get to walk, uh, walk in the shoes of a farmer. And this was an event we ran at the UK's largest salad grower, who's one of our members. They grow lettuces. It's all hand harvested at the moment. So we took a group of our members to really learn what is it like being out there? What does this labor shortage really mean? And how can automation, robotics, innovation really help? So we had a very diverse group who came out thinking, ah, oh, there are other ways that we can do this other than hand harvesting. So it really stimulated some thinking around innovation and how we could do things differently. Next slide, please. We feel it's very important that our technology uh, members and those who we work with can work closely with the farmers. So we run a program called the Farmer First Innovation Group, which is a very safe space in order to just gently introduce technologies to farmers. It might be something new that might be being developed for the UK market for a different crop, perhaps. And this is a space where it's almost like a focus group where farmers can give technologists and researchers feedback as to what price point they would use, how it would work with current um, farm practices before you go large on a market, just as a kind of safe early way to test out technology. Next slide, please. And we have a big annual conference. We've had, we've just recovered from the one we held in November this year. Again, high level interaction and speakers. Uh, this year we had the vice president of the National Farmers Union and the chief scientist of our, the equivalent of our Department for Agriculture. Exhibition opportunities, lots of networking, farmers there looking to find out about new technologies. And the next slide shows that this sits within a wider program that we run called Agritech Week. 
I won't, um, next slide please, Maria. I won't go through what all of those events are, but you can see there's a series of events that we put around that REAP conference to help give organizations like you, those who are not based in the UK, a reason to come and spend a week in the UK and find out more about the things that are going on. I could have the next slide. I think I only have one or two more. Oh, that's my final slide. So uh, those are my contact details. So please do get in touch. Uh, looking forward to hearing some of the questions. Apologies, this has been in English. My Spanish isn't nearly good enough, but to reiterate, you have a very warm welcome and I look forward to meeting you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Belinda. Now it's time to introduce um, the second speakers of today's session. Uh, Michael Gifford joined um, NIAB as Director of Commercialization in March 2019. His role is to develop revenue, revenue streams based on research and intellectual property being developed within the, uh, the organization. Within uh, this, he manages much of the SME uh, engagement, is active in developing spin-out um, opportunities and is leading the development of Band 4, a new agri-tech incubator on NIAB's campus in Cambridge. Michael is a serious entrepreneur and angel investor with C-suit experience across a range of sectors including law, engineering, agrochemicals, medical systems, software and infrastructure technology. His focus has been on working with fast-growing tech firms uh, where he uses strong st strategic and commercial instincts backed up by a solid technical background. Michael has a, P a PhD in physics uh, from Cambridge University and an MBA from HEC Paris, H -E -C Paris. So it's over to you, Michael. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Philippe. Um, so Philippe's introduced myself. Uh, I'm going to quickly introduce NIAB and then move on to giving some background around this kind of support, um, some of the support areas in the UK for agritech and companies uh, looking to work either here or with UK companies. And I, I try not to repeat too much of what Belinda has said, because she's covered quite a large chunk of the area very well already. Um, so NIAB is a research, independent research centre. It's over 100 years old. Um, we've got about 350 staff, most of whom are scientists. Um, and we're very focused on the crop science area of research. So that's looking at uh, both arable, uh, so broad fields and horticultural um, fruit and veg um, growth. We've got two main sites. Uh, we've got our head office uh, in Cambridge where we carry out a lot of our research. And then we have a center down in Kent, which is focused on fruit. Um, so if, Maria, could I have my first slide? I think that would be useful. I mean, it's not, there's not much on it, but it gets things going. Um, we've got a further 12 sites across the UK. Um, those are focused on running trials and NIAB's the largest trials organization in the country. We run um, outdoor trial plots. We run about 130,000 a year. Um, and that doesn't include all the work we do in our various glasshouse um, set sites. The focus of the research is on developing better plants and better farming techniques. Uh, we work across all UK um, plant types. Uh, so that's everything from wheat and barley, uh, potatoes, et cetera, in the fields, through to strawberries, raspberries, apples, tomatoes, lettuce, et cetera, um, either in the field or in glass. Um, the one thing that I think sets us apart from a lot of other organizations is the in the, in this sector is that we work very closely with the growers um, and we actually have an industry membership organization which is uh, different and complementary to the agritech e um, approach where and what we have is a lot of growers directly being uh, getting advice from my in in season on how how the industry is working and what they should be doing in the fields and that covers around 60 percent of the farmed area of the uk um, so it's, it's it it really captures quite a large chunk of the growers. Um, so moving on to the slide that's in front of you, uh, we also run an incubator um, which we set up in 2021. So we built it during the pandemic, which was interesting. Um, and we 
within that, we offer lab space, workshop space, and office space to organizations that are developing agritech technology and particularly where NIAB's other expertise can support the development of their technology. So we, it's adjacent, actually in that photo, just in the bottom left corner, you can see the edge of our glasshouse complex and the big building behind Barn 4 there is um, our conference center. All, and so companies based in Barn 4 have access to the glasshouse, the conference center, the field trials, and some of our other laboratory facilities outside what's available within the incubator itself. Um, but what I want to, I, I don't want this to be a, a sort of how brilliant is NIAB and Barn 4 presentation. So just want to point out that there are um, a number of other specialist agritech incubators in the UK. Uh, there's the Barclays Eagle Labs incubator in Lincoln, which um, is located on Lincoln University's uh, crop sciences and farming site, um, just on the outskirts of the city. There is uh, Farm 491 at the Royal Agricultural University. Um, and then there's Agri Epicenter, who run a number of um, incubator sites across the country. Uh, and they are very focused, particularly on the engineering robotics side of um, agritech. So, Maria, if I could have my next slide. Um, so, in terms of the, the sort of the infrastructure and the opportunities to get support within the UK. Um, I thought I'd start with the research centres. Um, again, obviously, NIAB is, is one of them and one of the, the higher profile and better established ones, but we're not by any means the only one. Um, this slide has a number of the logos of different places around, you know, around the UK um, research infrastructure, but it's by no means exhaustive. So there are a huge number of other um, institutes, some of which are directly working in crop sciences and some of which are adjacent to crop sciences. So I'll just pick out a few of these. Um, so I've mentioned Agri Epicenter as being um, very focused on robotics. Um, we've got uh, places like Crop Health and Protection, CHAP, which is, as it suggests, um, very focused on the crop protection side of things. Um, then again, to pick a few out, the James Hutton Institute is based up in Scotland and has particular expertise um, both in Scottish farming techniques, which are, differ slightly from those you find further south, um, but also in crops that are very specialist to Scotland, like barley and potatoes. Um, you've got organisations like Agrometrics, which is focused on data um, for the agricultural sector, and they they have huge levels of expertise in the data analysis and data collection and management um, for this area. The um, some of the others are more uh, sort of, I guess, close. They're, they're government for, directly government funded, um, and they, but they are focused in the area. So one of those would be the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew, which looks at uh, which carries um, a big store of germplasm across all types of species, not just crop species, um, but also carries out research in that area, um, in particular in things like phenotyping. Uh, the John Innes Centre, which I'm not going to try and tell you too much about because Belinda knows it far better than I do, having studied there. Um, but that's, again, a, a research centre um, up in Norwich that's um, very high quality. And then the Earlham Institute, which is next door to the John Innes Centre, which is um, very focused on the genomics and genetics. So the, one, the other thing I'd like to point out about the research centre network is that we, we sort of, to the outside, look like competitors, but actually far more often we're collaborators. And all of these organisations um, work together on all sorts of different projects. I don't, I think every, apart from SEAL, which is very focused on livestock, I know that NIAB has active collaborations with every single one of these organisations. Um, and so there's, there's a real ability in the UK to get support from whoever is best placed to provide it rather than simply um, having to pick one and stick with it. So um, the other thing that is worth pointing out is that there's a high level of respect within the agricultural industry for each of these organisations. Um, and so if you're bringing a product to the UK, it is worth engaging with one of these, one of these um, places because for things like trials and testing, uh, they carry quite a lot of weight. Uh, so a, a trial, a programme of trials from NIAB or James Hutton or Rothamsted will, will resonate within the industry and people will trust Trust the data that's that's provided from it. So Maria, if I could have my next slide. 
Um, now, you'll have noticed I didn't list any of the universities on that previous slide. Um, they are, um, the UK has a very strong and vibrant university uh, sector, um, one of the strongest in the world outside probably the US. The, and many of those universities have specialist uh, plant sciences, crop sciences, veterinary sciences, for those of you with interest in uh, livestock. Um, many, so departments that specialize in those, they also, a lot of them have adjacent technology areas such as robotics and AI and, and more general genetics. Um, the, I've given a list there again, these are the ones that we work with directly at any, you know, this week. But the, the list of um, the complete list of universities that work in this area wouldn't fit on one slide in any sense. It's it's enormous. Um, the I think the one thing, the only caveat I'd put about working with universities is they're slightly harder to engage with on commercial activities than the research centres would be. Um, they tend to be focused slightly further away from the farm. Um, and there are exceptions to that. So Harper Adams and SRUC on this list, and there's a few others, um, are, are specialist agricultural universities, and they have very close links to the farming sector. Um, but most of them are looking at things that are, well, the way I tend to describe it, maybe 20 years away from the farm gate, uh, between 10 and 20 years from the farm gate, whereas the research centres will be looking at things that are between five years and already on the farm. Um, so that's, a, that's just an easy sort of, Way to think about it, um, but they can. The universities can bring amazing expertise into projects, um, particularly where you're looking at the sort of harder science bits of it, um, if you like. So, Maria, if you could um, move on to the next slide. So, um, the the other bit that I wanted to just give a feel for was the funding landscape in the UK. Um, now, startup companies, whether they're Spanish, they're British, or or any other form, are often looking for support in the term in in terms of money. Um, the UK has a strong funding sector, but it, I won't pretend it's it's easy to uh, to access. And every year it feels like it gets a little bit harder, um, although maybe that's just um, the competition gets better. Um, the if I if I pick these bits off in order, we have the opportunity in the UK to apply for grants. Um, now, these can either be uh, regional so a lot of the areas in the UK are split into different regions and those regions often have uh, what would normally be called local enterprise um, partnerships or development um, development teams. They typically are able to offer relatively small grants um, between sort of 5,000, 10,000 pounds and in, in a small number of cases up to 100,000 pound type area. Um, they will be for encouraging investment and jobs in the region. Um, that's the sort of underlying driver. Um, but the, um, yeah, so they, they would be to help companies establish themselves. Not all of them, I'm afraid, will be available to companies coming from overseas, but there is a lot of support for that type of activity. Um, and I know the Cambridge region has a, has a team that's dedicated to bringing, uh, to bring in supporting overseas investment and overseas companies to the region. Um, so that can, that's the sort of regional level. At a national level, we have an organization called Innovate UK, through which most of the small company grants are, are um, focused. And so that has much larger, a much larger pot of money. Um, I can't remember how many billions it gives away each year, but it's, it's a significant amount. Um, and it, it's focused on develop, again, on, on Sort of kickstarting uh, economic development within the country, and indeed, and in particular, focusing on target sectors. Now, the good news is that agriculture and agritech are target sectors for the UK government. Um, the bad news is that funding is only available to UK companies. Um, but again, if we go back to the good news, it does apply to subsidiaries of overseas companies as long as those subsidiaries are registered in the UK and the bulk of the work is being carried out in the UK. So they are accessible. Um, within the Innovate UK grants, it's also very straightforward to collaborate with research centres and universities. It's, they're sort of set up for that kind of industrial, um, industrial academic style collaboration. Um, and many of the grant calls require that as a, as a part of them. 
Um, the final grant type um, I'm not going to talk very much about because I think you may have more information on it than I do is the Horizon grants, which are um, European Union grants, where the UK is now has now finally got round to um, sorting itself out so that UK organisations can take part in them. Um, and again, these are typically for collaborative programmes, um, often requiring multiple companies in multiple countries. Um, so that might they, they might be worth um, looking at from from the point of view of Spanish companies looking to establish in the UK or looking to develop products for the UK market. Um, so that's the grant horizon. The UK has a very strong venture capital and angel investment um, community. It's the, I think I believe it's still the strongest of that type in the in Europe. Um, I should caveat that with there's a it's relatively small still in agritech and agri, uh, agritech sort of technologies. Um, and I think the the reason for that is the investors. Uh, get worried about the timescales and the risk levels in agritech. It's still a fairly new technology sector. And because of the speed that plants grow at, things take a little while longer than they would if you're doing electronics or human life sciences, uh, some of these other areas where actually human life sciences takes a long time to develop, but there are some very clear, there's a very clear pathway so they can see the they can see the value of their investments going um, going up and um, but there are some specialist uh, venture capital firms looking in agrotech, and there are some specialist angel groups, again, focused on agrotech. Um, I'm not going to list them here, partly because I, they change so often. Um, but again, myself or Belinda can always help with, with introductions to those. And then the final type of funding, which I think is actually, personally, I always advise small companies to look at, is funding from clients. And that by that, I mean people actually buying the product. Um, the UK farmers obviously, like any country, split into different categories in terms of their risk profiles and their risk appetites. Um, but many of them are a quite large farming organisations, um, and b have um, so in, in a good year they may have cash surpluses and they will invest in new technologies, um, and they will look at new things and they're quite quite excited. In fact, Belinda's example of G's that she brought up in one of her slides is is a an example of a very large farming organisation that has a very active appetite for um, agritech. They will let people trial technologies on their land. Um, they will invest in those technologies in the companies that develop them, and they will buy those technologies once they've been proven to work. Um, but Jesus is just one example. There's a whole there's a whole range of them. Um, and again, they will work. They'll collaborate on on research programmes and development programmes, but they'll also um, help with the funding uh, if if they feel the technology is appropriate for them. Um, so I think that's that's sort of the end of my slides. I'm obviously very happy to take questions um, and very happy, as I'm sure Belinda is, to be contacted by any of the organisations on this if you have specific um, specific interests that we might be able to help with. Thank, thank you very much, Michael. It's now time for the Q&A uh, sections. Section for those willing to ask questions to our speakers, uh, please leave your question in the in the uh, chat, and we shall pass them on, on to Belinda and Michael. I think we had a couple of them, but I think that Belinda has already applied to to two of them. I don't know if you want to uh, comment uh, further on those two questions, or maybe if um, my Michael Han uh, wants to to add some information to the to. Um, Belinda's replies. The questions were uh, there was one question from Fumi Ogar, uh, which is a pest control and uh, fumigation products company, and they were interested in knowing the crops which are grown under greenhouses and how many hectares of greenhouses are quantified. Um, Belinda, uh, there's some information regarding this in the in the chat between two thousand two and three thousand, if I remember well. Well. Shall I just e expand on that? So the reason yes. it has such a big margin of error is that I think in 2018, it will 2020, it was something like two and a half thousand, which was an increase. But with the uh, current geopolitical instability and the cost of energy, there has actually been a reduction in the use of glasshouse. Some of the growers have shortened their growing season because of the cost of energy to heat. So even though the glasshouse real estate 
is there, we can't necessarily assume that it's all being used for production or certainly last year when energy prices were so very high. I'm afraid I'm not close enough, Michael may know, uh, to, to know where we are right now, but um, the, we can't necessarily assume that the area is all being used as a result of the energy costs. And then, and I, all I can say is Belinda's right. That's that is the situation that we, we're in. Uh, um, a lot of the larger glasshouse companies have found that the cost of heating or cooling the glasses exceeds the value they res they can gain from the cucumbers um, or the tomatoes or whatever they they're growing in there. Thank you. The second question was from DNT Number from Fabrics. And uh, he was asking about how relevant is the thermal fleece consumption in the UK agriculture? This is not my area at all. I, I know there is a big market for, for thermal fleece, mainly, I think, in horticulture. But am I right? I, I think carrots, carrots are put down to straw, aren't they, Michael? So they're normally that's... put down to straw, um, although there is... I mean, the advantage of straw is you get the you also get biomass being put into the yeah. into the ground at the end of the whole operation. The downside of straw is there's quite a big market now for straw in the energy production industry. Um, yeah. The uh, I don't know if anyone's using fleece directly on carrots, at least uh, outside a sort of um, very small garden scale, where I wouldn't be mm -hmm. surprised if people are doing it. I know that straw is what I'm seeing in the fields, sort mm -hmm. of round about now and going through into the winter. Um, Mm. But if, if as, I, as I said in the chat, if your fleece is biodegradable, if it can add value back into the soil, then that would be of a lot of interest because part of the problem with fleeces and covers and plastics and things are that they're not very sustainable. So depending on the nature of, of your material, Luis, then um, it could potentially be of interest if it ticks that sustainability box. Yeah, I think just staying on the police thing, which clearly me and Belinda are experts on now. Um, <laughs> the other area where I think it might be worth um, exploring, and I don't know what the actual reality of this is, is in the, in what we call novel crops. Um, mm -hmm. Now, these are crops like chickpeas and lentils. There are a lot of them are legumes, um, which they're not novel in the sense that they're grown in lots of other parts of the world, but they're typically grown in warmer, uh, more Mediterranean climates. Um, we're trying to introduce them. There's quite a lot of work going on to introduce them into the UK climate. And the big the big challenge there is uh, late frosts um, and and the impact that that has on yield. And it wouldn't surprise me if people are looking at uh, thermal insulation as a way of protecting the crops in the instance that there's a there's a potential for a, a, late, a sort of late April, May type frost. Um, spell so i think that's something that's that's worth looking at but i don't know i don't know what the, the level of that and it's a growing it's a small but growing area of uk agriculture we have a third question from um uh, pablo uh, from granite satellite technologies and they are interested in offering their knowledge in satellite imagery processing to agri-tech companies in the uk he's wondering which would be the best way uh, and place for doing it and meet these companies? Well, it would be remiss of us not to say, obviously, you need to set up an office in Barn 4 and join AgriTech E. What better way <laughs> could there be? Um, perhaps, well, Michael, do you want to pick that up? Well, um, um, what Belinda said is <laughs> it's right. It's good to be here. And um, but I think with a lot of this stuff, you don't have to set up an office straight away. But I do think that um, Joining Agritech he would be a sense, and that's not just me being nice to Belinda, that's that's the reality. Um, the one thing I would say in the satellite imagery space for farming, um, there's a lot of it around in the UK. There's a lot of companies working in this area, uh, and some of them have got very nice products, and some of them um, it's less clear what the products are providing to the farmers. I think the, the key bit is to really work closely with the growers um, and the agronomists um, because they will be able to tell you what the farmers actually want from this satellite imagery. It's, it, there's a, there was a huge wave of companies offering satellite imagery of farms, but it wasn't telling the farmers what to do. And so it wasn't that useful. And the farmers, I think, have got a little bit sort of jaded, bored 
of that. So, it, <laughs> but the, this, the current sort of cycle seems to be giving farmers more insight. Um, so if your technology is able to provide that, then I would suggest, um, yes, Agritechy work with Belinda and her team to talk to the growers and the agronomists. And in the UK, I don't know what the what the structure of the, um, the market's like in Spain, but in the UK, you have typically medium to large farms, at least on a European scale, and large agronomy organisations that provide the advice to those farmers on what to grow, how to grow it, what to treat the farms with. Um, and those agronomy organisations can be every bit as important as the growers in terms of making buying decisions. So uh, it's a bit different. <clears throat> I, know, I know the French system better than the Spanish one way. And in the French system, you've got these big cooperatives that provide that level of support and their agronomists are separated from distribution. Whereas in the UK, a lot of the agronomists are tied to distribution companies. And so mm. navigating that the, the landscape of the sector um, is important because it's, it is different um, depending on which country you're in um, and you have to be talking to the right person. Yeah, just, just to add to that, and thank you for your, your kind words, Michael. We run a, a program called Ag 101, which is designed for organizations. In fact, Michael has, has been kind enough to, to be part of the presenting team on that to help companies understand the shape and the dynamic of the industry, how what the routes to market are, how to actually start to get a foothold. We run those in September. We might run one a bit earlier, um, but to, to actually navigate that, because looking at the question, Pablo, uh, you're offering the processing to agri-tech companies. So I'm not sure whether you're, who, who you see as your target customer, because um, if it's the processing, technology to give those actionable insights as we would would call them as michael says you know what would you do so what i've got this image so what so i think it it really would depend also on who your customer is whether you want to talk direct to farmers or whether you want to talk to others who are perhaps putting up satellite imagery payload getting getting the information and what you do is actually give those all important actions and insights so i think depending depending on where you are it might be a slightly different answer as to who your target customer would be and how to uh, sort of tackle them but we can we can chat about that thank you um i think we we've still have some um few minutes left yeah uh Pablo is asking to um if we can ch change his status we can do yeah, yeah, I'm going to, to try. Pablo, I think you can you can speak now. Hello, Michael, Belinda, do you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, and thank you very much for your uh, for your answer. Uh, well, as Belinda said, uh, yeah, our target are these agrotech companies are not directly farmers or uh, agronomists. That's why we are offering them through API and uh, other uh, valuable reports and insight that we provide them um, directly to these companies because these companies already offer their products to agronomists yeah. and farmers. And that's why we uh, do an integration of our little maps that we produce thanks to satellite imagery directly into their platforms, for example, or into their uh, mobile applications or whatever. Um, we are very focused on very high resolution satellite imagery. So tree crops uh, are very nice for us, like vineyards and so on. And uh, that's why we are very focused on this type of company, not directly the farmers and growers. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I ask, no, I mean, if there are or events, places where we can go present uh, our services to these tech companies that already know mm. how these images work and we can present them directly these insights that we have for them. Yeah. Can I, do you want me to quickly put something out there which I, I'm thinking of which you, so there is an organization which I didn't mention in my presentation called the Satellite Applications Catapult. Mm. Um, this is a <laughs> funded but semi-independent, I'm never quite sure of the status, semi-independent organisation that has um, very strong links across the entire satellite 
industry and satellite so it's quite a big industry in the uk we have um we have various companies that lead in um lead on a global level they it would be worth i think um getting in touch with them as well as as belinda um because the they may well have a feel for where your technology fits into okay C could you tell me again the name michael yeah i'll put it into the chat it'll be easier i think okay mm -hmm. thank you yeah just also to if i've understood uh pablo what what you're saying you you've potentially hit on a uh, as we say a holy grail because that interoperability between image insights actions and information has traditionally been quite challenging and mm -hmm. we've lacked the technology or the industry has lacked the ability to combine and integrate all of those now as michael said this is quite a busy space so i think i would echo michael's suggestion around being really clear about your value proposition maybe doing a bit of competitor analysis to see who else is is active in this space and why your solution is different you know for example are you able to eliminate cloud cover do you use synthetic data um to you know algorithms to train to fill uh -huh. in gaps when the satellite is, is going over so everybody kind of says how brilliant they are uh, but I think really dig digging, I mean, everybody else says how brilliant they are. I know you're brilliant. Um, really digging down into how your offering is really different. So there are no shortage of, of outlets, as I mentioned, all those conferences and trade shows and exhibitions that I put on one of one of the slides. But before you go, go out to them, just being absolutely sharp on how your solution is different and better, I think will be really helpful. Yeah, okay. I understood. Thank you very much. I will take it in mind. So I've just realized Thank everything you. I'm putting on the chat is just going to Maria. Um, hang yeah. on yes, there's, there's another question um, from uh, Alexandra from Agricubic uh, Systems. Uh, he says that they are vertical, a vertical farming solution producer, and he's asking um, what could be the best way in your opinion to enter the UK market? find some reseller or distributor or distributor and he's linda or do you want me to <laughs> farming solutions. we've we've probably both got, got why don't you you go first and i'll okay. i'll so vertical farm is another another sort of technology area that's had a huge amount of growth and interest in the uk it's a big it's a it's a, had a lot of funding put into it both private and also government um <coughs> i think it's fair to say that if we look back five, maybe maybe ten years, probably only five years, there's quite a big shift in the way people are approaching it because it's it, there's been a lot of companies that have come and gone because they didn't have the right business model, um, and so the ones that are still there are quite robust and they have a they've got quite a clear position in the market. I think in terms of you talk about vertical farming solutions, there's there's that clearly is a it's quite a wide potential range. Um, if it's a sort of you can deliver a vertical farm for a, for a produ for production, um, then um, it's quite crowded. But if your farm is better and faster and cheaper and all these other things, then there's you know it, whether you go for a reseller or whether you have a sales team of your own in country is is a very much a commercial decision for yourselves. I don't know of any resellers that would pick that up. Um, if what you've got is a technology that fits into other people's vertical farms, I'd know a better lighting system or a better irrigation system or a new, you know, new way of producing fertilizer, then there are a lot of vertical farming companies that would be definitely worth talking to. And some of them would be interested and some of them may have their own solutions. Um, <laughs> the best place to go for a list of those is, not surprisingly, Acrotechi. Um, and uh, in the past, they've run specialist uh, seminar days purely on vertical farming. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that Belinda has links into, I guess, every vertical farming company in, in the UK. If you're more at the sort of trials and testing stage, um, we'd be interested in talking to you. Uh, Stockbridge Technology Centre would also potentially be an interesting place to look at. And the James Hutton Institute in Scotland have um, a vertical farming complex as well. So there's a few places that can support on a research on the sort of research center side of things with slightly different 
angles on it, we tend to look at the plants that go into the vertical farming. Stockbridge would be um, a bit of that and a bit of the technology. And James Hutton, again, would be more technology and with a little bit on the plants. I don't know if that's fair. Um, James Hutton, they might disagree with that, but they're not on the call. <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> Alessandra, if, if you wanted to to get it get in touch so we can sort of understand a bit more about the offering, um, I think there's been quite a lot of research done in the Netherlands around the um, economic viability of vertical farms in northern temperate Europe, um, and I'm not going to lie, there have been a number of vertical farms that have not made it in the UK and there's not very many, there's, I can count on the fingers of one hand, the ones who are making a success of it. But if you have a solution that is an enabling solution, then partnering with some of the other providers gives you then access to a global market. So for example, one that I'm thinking of that's co-located as, as Michael said at the James Hutton Institute, they have just signed a very big deal uh, in, uh, I think it's Dubai or Middle East, so they're opening up those global markets, which via a partnership, perhaps with a UK company that could then open that market up to you. I think um, it's quite difficult to find too many actual producers and people who are running vertical farms who would be looking for new solutions, unless, as Michael said, you've got a fully integrated system that is cheaper, faster, uh, uses less energy, um, all the rest of it. But investors, um, you, you're better off partnering with the ones who are who are already making a success of it, uh, just as exactly as Michael said. And I think the other thing to point out is that some of the technologies in vertical farms are very applicable to greenhouses yeah. and yeah. polytunnels, yeah. and there's quite a lot of movement between the two mm. with sensors and lighting systems and irrigation systems yeah. and the like. Um, <laughs> Cheaper for sure, Alessandro. <laughs> Thank you. So, any further questions? I think we still have some minutes left. Well, if there are no further questions, um, our webinar is then uh, coming to an end. And um, but before concluding, um, however, I should like to to say a special thank you to Belinda and Michael who gave us some mo most interesting presentations and supported us to to put together this this webinar. Both presentations can be sent by email to those attendees willing to to receive them, as I uh, mentioned in the in the chat. Should be interested, please send us an email to reinunido@lucia.tre.es. And that's it for me. I don't know if uh, my colleagues want to add something. If not, I'm, I'm just to say I've enjoyed enjoyed listening to the questions, and and it's, I hope it's been I hope it's been useful. Um, I also hope at some stage I get to come to end of this year, and um, because it's got, got to be a lot a lot warmer than um, the Midlands is in the, in England today. Um, and yeah, if anyone needs to know more, wants to get in touch, then you've got my email now in the chat rather than just being sent directly to Maria. So do feel free to, to reach out. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, to, thank you uh, once again and have a very good day. Bye bye. Thank you. Very nice to meet you, you all. Thank get in you touch. So much. See you soon. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.